The brutal murder of Charles Walton, on February 14, 1945, remains one of Britain's strangest unsolved cases. Seemingly motiveless, riddled with rumors of occult practices, and hampered by a wall of silence from potential witnesses, it confounded even the greatest detective of the time, Scotland Yard's legendary Robert Fabian. On the day of his murder, Walton, a 74-year-old farmhand, went to work in the morning as normal in the town of Lower Quinton. His niece, Edith, with whom he shared a small home, grew concerned as darkness fell without any sign of him. Eventually, she set out to search for him, together with his employer, Alfred Potter, and his colleague, Harry Beasley. What they found was shocking. Walton's body lie near a hedgerow, in the field in which he had been working that day. His bill hook, a tool used for hedge trimming, was buried in his neck. A pitchfork was also driven through his throat. The prong tool had been plunged so violently that its prongs were bent back from striking the frozen ground beneath. Walton's walking stick was found nearby with blood and hair on it, indicating a vicious beating. The murder was so brutal and so baffling, local police made the decision to bring in Scotland Yard. Upon arriving in Lower Quinton, Chief Inspector Fabian immediately started looking at those Walton interacted with on a daily basis as possible suspects. Inquiries revealed that Walton's employer, Albert Potter, was dishonest and bad-tempered. He was often late paying employees, as he was allegedly embezzling funds and juggling the remaining cash between creditors to keep them from finding out. Furthermore, when questioned, Potter's story was inconsistent, changing several times during different interviews. Fabian considered Potter the prime suspect, but never gathered enough evidence to charge him. When attempting to question locals about the crime, however, Fabian encountered a wall of silence. When villagers would speak, they said as little as possible. Some wouldn't talk at all. Were they wary of outsiders? Or did they have something to hide? The lack of possible suspects combined with the villagers' eerie silence and the horrific state of Walton's body led to a sinister rumor, Walton's murder was occult-related. The location of the murder only fanned the flames of such rumors. The farmhand had been slain near Mian Hill, a place known locally for its supposedly supernatural links. Furthermore, Walton was killed on February 14. According to Wikipedia, that date, under the old calendar, marked the pagan festival Imbolc, leading some to believe the murder was part of some ancient ritual. There were also rumors about Walton, himself that suggested an occult-related murder. Some believed the farmhand to be a witch, with the ability to cast the evil eye upon fellow villagers and famine upon fellow farmers. It is suggested that he had been blamed for a poor harvest in 1944 and was subsequently murdered ritualistically so that his blood might soak back into the soil and renew it. Another rumor, occult in nature, spread in the wake of Walton's demise, that a black dog had been seen lurking in the area where he died. The superstitious inhabitants of Quinton believed that black dogs were a harbinger of death. Even Fabian reported seeing a black dog while investigating near Mian Hill. It's likely we'll never know the truth about Walton's murder. The perpetrator was never apprehended, and the motive never uncovered, making the bizarre and horrific case of the Pitchfork murder the longest-running unsolved slaying in the history of the Warwickshire Constabulary. At the time of his investigation, Fabian fervently denied any occult-related activity associated with Walton's grisly death. However, 25 years later, Fabian made this ominous statement in his book, The Anatomy of Crime. I advise anybody who is tempted at any time to venture into black magic, witchcraft, shamanism, call it what you will, to remember Charles Walton and to think of his death, which was clearly the ghastly climax of a pagan rite. There is no stronger argument for keeping as far away as possible from the villains with their swords, incense, and mumbo-jumbo. It is prudence on which your future peace of mind and even your life could depend. On September 14, 1988, searchers in a vacant lot unearthed the body of Jacqueline Dowa Libby, a Chicago-area seven-year-old girl who had been taken from her own bedroom four nights earlier. 
Her mother, Cynthia, had reported Jacqueline missing and presumably abducted on the morning of September 10. Responding officers discovered a broken basement window that appeared to be a point of entry until David Dawa Libby, Jacqueline's adoptive father, said he thought he saw that the back door had been left open. That small bit of potentially conflicting information raised questions that perhaps Jacqueline's parents knew more about her disappearance than they claimed. As authorities waited several days for a ransom call that never came, they began to look more closely at Cynthia and David Dawa Libby. Jacqueline's remains were discovered in Blue Island, a Chicago suburb about six miles from her home. Officers interviewed occupants of the surrounding area and thought they might have a valuable tip for local resident Everett Mann. Mann told the cops that, at around 2 a.m. on the night Jacqueline disappeared, he saw a person with a large, straight nose speeding away from the location where the dead girl had been left. He also said the figure drove off in a dark car, maybe brown, probably blue, and, after pressure from the police, men added that it was most likely a 1979 Chevy Malibu. David Dalla Libby fit the bill in terms of the distinctive facial feature. Cynthia owned a 1980 Chevy Malibu. For the next two months, law enforcement agents built a case against the Dow Alibis. In November 1988, police arrested David and Cynthia for the murder of their daughter. Cynthia was two months pregnant at the time of her arrest. As the Dow Alibis court date approached, public sentiment took a hard stance against the couple. In April 1990, the trial judge called both the prosecutors and the defense lawyers to his chambers. He said insufficient evidence existed to convict Cynthia and that he would be dismissing her charges. The case against David, however, could keep moving forward. A month later, after three days of deliberation, a jury found David Dawa Libby guilty of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced him to 45 years. Immediately following David's conviction, Cynthia flew into action to clear her husband. She started a grassroots campaign, attracting the attention of several journalists who also took up the cause. In addition to other prosecutorial missteps, Everett Mann, the man whose eyewitness testimony put David at the location where Jacqueline's body was found, proved to be a highly dubious source. First, throughout his interrogation, Mann changed multiple details from his story. Second, he identified David from a forward-facing photo despite having claimed to only see a shadowy figure in profile from 75 yards away in the middle of the night. Most devastatingly, it came to light that Mann had been rejected for police duty due to bipolar disorder issues and that he'd long been struggling with other symptoms of mental illness. In addition, other witnesses claimed they saw Cynthia's car parked in the Dow Alibi's driveway when the abduction occurred, and no one else near the Blue Island dump site had spotted any kind of vehicle. In October 1991, the Illinois Court of Appeals overturned David's conviction and freed him from jail. While some investigators and observers still believe that David and possibly Cynthia may have been involved in Jacqueline's murder, others point to a suspect that police originally let go when he seemed to have an alibi. Timothy Guess, the brother of Jacqueline's biological father, had previously been accused of trying to kidnap his young niece. During Jacqueline's actual abduction, Guess, who had been clinically diagnosed as schizophrenic, told the cops he'd been hanging out in an all-night diner. Two waitresses backed him up. Later, after NBC's Unsolved Mysteries devoted an episode to Jacqueline's murder, a tipster alleged that Timothy Guess was lying. One of the waitresses recanted her original statement, saying that she lied because she believed the Dow Alibis were guilty and wanted them to go to jail. This time, she told authorities that Guess had only briefly dropped by the restaurant at around 9.30 p.m. The Illinois state's attorney reopened the case and grilled Guess anew. Despite having never been to the Dow Alibi's home, he seemed to know details of the layout. Guess said that he knew these details because a spirit lived inside him and supplied him with such details. Despite mounting questions, Guess never faced any charges. He died in 2002. As a result, the murder of Jacqueline Dawa Libby, who would now be 47 years old, remains a mystery still. 
On September 5, 1934, a woman's torso, with thighs still attached, was found on the shore of Lake Erie near Cleveland, Ohio. Her skin was red and textured like leather, indicating that some kind of harsh chemical had been applied to her body. She became known as the Lady of the Lake. Because her head was never found, authorities failed to identify her. Yet just a few years later, police identified the headless corpse as the possible first victim of an active serial killer in the Cleveland area, the Cleveland Torso Murderer. Between 1935 and 1938, the Cleveland Torso Murderer claimed 12 confirmed victims, disposing of their butchered remains in the Kingsbury Run area of Cleveland. Quite likely, the killer claimed additional lives, some investigators placed the murder victim count as high as 20. Yet despite a massive investigation, which at one point was led by prominent lawman Elliot Ness, the identity of the Cleveland Torso Murderer remains a mystery to this day. Kingsbury Run was a low-lying industrial area along the east side of Cleveland. It once contained a natural watershed that drained stormwater into the nearby Cuyahoga River. It also carried a rough reputation in the 1930s, as impoverished families, many of whom lost their homes during the Great Depression, set up shanty towns there. In September of 1935, two teenagers wandering through Kingsbury Run came across the body of a man stripped nude, save for a pair of socks. Washed clean and drained of blood, the man's wrists showed signs of rope burn. Both his head and genitalia had been removed. Lucky for police, the victim could be identified via fingerprints as Edward Andresi, a drifter who had prior arrests. Not far from Andresi's remains were those of another male victim. A bit older, he had also been decapitated and fully castrated. This corpse, however, had likely been dead for far longer, and his skin was covered in the same chemical burn as the Lady of the Lake from 1934. Clues were sparse. Then in January of 1936 a woman stumbled upon two baskets near a manufacturing plant. Tucked inside were the remains of a woman's body, neatly wrapped in newspaper, with her head nowhere to be found. Similar to Edward Andresi, police used fingerprints to positively identify the victim as Flo Palillo, a bartender and occasional prostitute. Six months went by before a new victim surfaced, this time close to home. Cleveland authorities discovered the remains of a young man right next to a police precinct. Washed, drained of blood, and with his head removed, the victim's body was adorned with distinctive tattoos. He became known as the Tattooed Man and authorities worked to identify him. They even fashioned a plaster version of the victim's head and circulated photos among the public in hopes that someone might recognize his face. Alas, just like the Lady of the Lake, the victim's identity remained a mystery. New victims continued to surface throughout the Cleveland area. All were decapitated, with many of the heads nowhere to be found. Clearly, authorities were dealing with the work of a serial killer, someone who preyed upon those in the lower ranks of society and whose identities were difficult to track. By 1938, the city of Cleveland was on edge and the police had reached a breaking point. They turned to the site that seemed to be the source of the mysterious killer's bloodlust, the homeless encampment in Kingsbury Run. Just after midnight on August 18, police raided the shanty town. They rounded up 63 men and searched for clues before setting the entire encampment ablaze. The media roundly criticized the raid for its unnecessary aggression. Nevertheless, after that fiery night in August, the deadly attack ceased. As the city breathed a sigh of relief, authorities doubled down on their investigation. In July of 1939, they zeroed in on a bricklayer named Frank Dolajal, who had once lived with Flo Palillo. Further investigation revealed that Dolajal was connected to Edward Andresi. Dolajal also knew a woman named Rose Wallace, a missing person widely believed to be Jane Doe Six, a torso murder victim, although authorities could not conclusively prove the two were one and the same. Authorities arrested Dolajal in connection with Palillo's murder that August. Dolajal confessed to the killing, yet he did so in such an incoherent manner that its reliability remained uncertain. 
the bricklayer never had another chance to clear his name. He was found hanging in his jail cell before the case ever went to court. Strangely, Dolajol died by a makeshift noose that hung just 5 feet and 7 inches off the floor, this despite standing 5 foot 8 inches tall. An autopsy revealed that the suspect had sustained broken ribs while in custody. Was Dolajol's death truly a suicide? Or had police decided they found their man, regardless of guilt? In 2010, researchers from Cuyahoga Community College released evidence that cleared Dolajol's name. To this day, the story of the Cleveland Torso murderer case remains one of America's most disturbing murder mysteries. It has inspired everything from In the Wake of the Butcher, by James Jesson Badel, to the graphic novel, Torso, by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Andreco to a nod in the film Seven Psychopaths. Officially, the case remains unsolved. Given the time that's passed since the first murder took place, the killer's identity will likely remain a mystery forever. If you found this video intriguing, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more captivating content.